Okay, good evening and welcome. It's lovely to see people coming to join the show this evening. And what a packed in sorted show we have following on from last week. We're actually going to do the, the show in kind of backwards this evening because that kind of made sense to me. And as I'm running the show and it made sense to me, I thought, well, do you know what? I can do that. So we're going to do. We're going to be going to be starting off in a minute with Ashdale Falls Part Two, and the reason we're going to finish finish start with the finish, as it were, is because there's a little bit of a philosophical. I can't even speak a philo philosophical area of debate, maybe. So I'm hoping that you might get involved with the chat with that one. Uh, but because of that philosophical discussion, I thought it'd be better to have that before we have a look at the autobiography of a yogi than have it at the end and then have that discussion because then it would be a really strange ending. So we're going to have a look at part two of Ashdale Falls. Then we're going to get to the autobiography of a yogi. And then kind of we have to discuss a little bit about the fact that this weekend is the RSPB's Big Garden Birdwatch which is a pretty awesome thing to do. And then we're going to finish off with a video about egrets. Now that video of egrets is, I've kind of resurrected it because it was in, it was in, the, uh, in the scheduling last spring. And for one reason or another, it never, ever, ever got aired. So as I've had a bit of a roller coaster week, and it's been kind of somewhat kind of entertaining and challenging and up and down and all of those strange things, and I haven't got out as much as I would like to have done, it seemed like the perfect time to get it on the show. So on that basis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to play the video of Ashdale Falls Part 2. Now, there is a bit of a spoiler here. We don't actually get to Ashdale Falls until we get to part three. But we have got part two here. So um, it's that first section around the Giant's Graves that's kind of got that little bit of an element to it because, well, I'm going to play the video and then you'll see. So here we go. Video section part one, Ashdale Falls, and we're ready to rock and roll. So behind me, what you can see is the interior of what would have been a burial chamber. The section behind me would have been covered over with earth. Where I am now would have been a half circle or maybe a horseshoe shaped area at the entrance to the chamber. They would bring up their recently deceased. They would put the bodies up on wooden trestles, platforms for ravens and other birds to come along and remove the flesh before the bones were then interred in a chamber. Which all kind of sounds a little bit barbaric, but if you think you're dealing with the people who quite probably understood that this physical form was just temporary and that the spirit would return to where it came from before it got mixed up and returned in a different form, Actually, it's not that barbaric at all. 
it kind of makes sense. Just points out how so many of our preconceptions are based on our own versions of what's real, when we don't actually know. It's an amazing, amazing place though. Rosemary, willow herb, bracken, and birch. As far as I know, there's no rain in the forecast. But the wind that there is is coming at me from in front. Those clouds are looking a little dark. So, you just have to bear in mind that because this is Scotland and the weather can do anything it wants, and quite often does, just maybe to be a little bit careful and maybe not dawdle too much. So, I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts on, on the burial, because one of the reasons probably why they were able to put people who died up on, if you like, big plinths and left, if you like, left, left the bodies to rot and to leave ravens, corvids and maybe foxes, jackals, who knows, to come and actually take away the flesh from the bodies. But it's probably pretty, I'd imagine it's pretty hard to actually dig into the ground anywhere at all, especially up on the Isle of Arran. It's a pretty tough terrain. It may just have been the fact that it was so hard to dig that it was a way of disposing of bodies. Because effectively, if you think about it, whether or not we put 
bodies back into the ground, whether we burn them and scatter the ashes, or whether we let other animals take away the the flesh, is still part of that cycle. Things are still kind of going back into the system, regenerating nutrients to further growth. But the thing that kind of crossed my mind was the one that, and I remember watching of the Mel Gibson film, Apoc uh, not Apocalyptica, but a pop, that movie, the one that was kind of like, I think he did shortly after the Jesus Christ one, and it had one or two kind of issues about sacrifice around it. And it just kind of got me thinking, especially after having read the autobiography of a yogi, which is this book, about how we explain and understand life. Because if you like, all religions, all philosophies, just along that kind of spiritual nature are generally trying to explain what it's all about, Alfie, kind of thing. And we have this Christian notion that, you know, we're here for now and then we die and we go off to heaven and God, but death is thing we should be avoiding and not go for and all the rest of it. And I mean, this is something I really do ex explore a lot in the view over the wall, because I think it's kind of, it's really interesting to be fair, but it, because and in the autobiography of a yogi, I mean, we always talk about the journey between birth and death, but he spends a lot of time talking about the journey between death and birth. And if you think everything's energy, then that kind of might be possible. Now, if you are a civilization where you absolutely believe that your soul carries on and there is an afterlife and this is not the only thing, the only part of it. And just maybe those people who were selected for sacrifice were actually willing billions, victim, well, victims, willing participants. Because if you firmly believe in that afterlife thing, then it might be considered that to be the sacrifice, for want of a better word, is actually an honour rather than a terrible, terrible thing. And you kind of then get onto that imposing your opinions on other people's ideas. And that kind of got me thinking from those giants, stones, giants graves up on the Isle of Arran. So it's amazing somewhere where something that comes along can actually influence the way you think. It can influence how you behave. And I just kind of enjoy those moments of indecision, moments of difficulty that make us think. Because it's not having the answers, I think, that is the most important thing. It's asking questions that fire you up and excite you and kind of give you a, a bit of a purpose. Um, and it's amazing how going out and walking into the countryside can actually fire up questions and quite often actually generate some answers or at least give you some time out from the hubbub of what we're usually about and what we're usually doing and what's occupying our minds so that you can actually think about some of those intricately difficult questions which in a lot of ways was again where the view over the wall came from and that kind of big first chapter that's kind of kibosh some people and had other people go that was really really good but it all kind of like encompasses that that, that element and i just find it really really interesting so anyway that was what i was looking forward to a bit of discussion which is always a good thing so the autobiography of a yogi. I love reading this book. It's funny. I've known about it for probably 30, 35 ish years because it was the source of well, the, the inspiration for John Anderson when yes, recorded and wrote the album Tales from Topographic Oceans. John Anderson had read this book, and as those of us kind of in the know, know that John Anderson is not entirely on this planet. He's very kind of on a spiritual level, and 
So I'd, I'd, I'd read about this book because there's quite a few extensive sleeve notes on the album. And he referred to various sections of this book. But I didn't read it for yonks. And it wasn't till I kind of had probably about half, half two thirds of, of an idea of, of where the view over the wall was going to be. And I started reading around uh, various different religions, various different spiritualities, um, and wanting a knowledge of those different religions. See, I mean, I've become a bit of a bit of a bookworm. And yet I'm not a bookworm at all. It's not books, it's knowledge. And I, I, I want to know, you know, I, I really have a need for that knowledge and for growth. And so I got the autobiography of a yogi. And funnily enough, I actually read it. We were, we were away at a place over in, oh, senior moment. It's a place locally, not that far away, where we used to go, this little, little mistletoe cottage. And kind of inspirational things happened there. It was a really kind of special place. And oh, I begin to ask, and there's a windmill there, and I can't remember. But anyway. But as I say, he talks a lot of it of his text is about the very his his yogis, the people who taught him, and some of them had come back after death, and he's talking about seeing them and visions and receiving messages and everything else. And he writes it in such a way that even with our Western upbringing, it's hard to say, nah, what a lot of tosh. You know? And you have, to, you have to start saying, well, do you know what? Actually, is this possible? You know, what happens to the soul? Is it like a candle flame? Does it you know, flicker and burn because you can put a candle flame out and then when you strike a match and you light it again and that candle flame comes back and there's something really cool about candle flames so maybe just maybe if you think about that that soul that thing that gives us life that when we our physical form comes to an end as it has to then you kind of think if energy can't be created or destroyed that just maybe there has to be something and there were some potential explanations within the autobiography of a yogi and that was really interesting and, re and it just kept fueling thought and I mean I, the, the second chapter in the view of the wall had been quite a long time in germination if you like it I mean I'd had the basic idea but I've been scared silly by it and it was sitting down in a little missile so one afternoon and in a couple of hours I pretty much wrote the whole plan for that chapter one of those kind of inspired moments you know, maybe if you remember was talking about the story or the book called Big Magic, uh, which is about the fact that there's, you know, plants, animals, rocks, and creativity floating around in this world. And creativity is a kind of entity by itself, and every now and then it kind of drops in. And if you accept it, you have that moment of inspiration. And we'll have one of those over at Shep as well. And the whole of that chapter dropped in. And the autobiography of a yogi I was reading at the time. So it's one of those, just maybe, it's everything was aligning. And, you know, I firmly believe that when things are at the right place and the right time and everything does align, and you possibly are on that line of divine purpose, because there are definitely times when those things that you need do just drop in. The things that you want appear. It's almost as if when you're aligned with whatever that purpose is, everything becomes easy and simple and straightforward. And you know why you're here, what you're on this planet to do. And that's really, really cool. And one of the reasons we know that that is, is because quite often when we're not on the right path, doing the wrong thing, life's really, really tough. So I kind of got into the whole philosophy of, of autobiography of a yogi. And when you actually get to the point where you, the fella basically through you know, knew when he was going to die. And he knew when it was when he was going to be, where it was going to be. And he actually had everything set up and everyone's going, come on, you're not about to die. He's going, yeah, I am. I've done my stuff. I'm like, oh, cool. I will be going. And he died, I think, at the age of 53. And he had everything sorted out. Knew he was going to die. Knew where it was. And... It's one of those 
stories. But he writes it so convincingly that even if it is mush, he absolutely believes it. And being one of the kind of like really big high figures up in, in the Hindu religion at the time, gives him a kind of authenticity. And when you read around and have read things from Buddhism and Islam and African shamanism and our own Celtic spiritual past, and there's a real mesh of which the autobiography of a yogi was a part of. It's a pretty big, thick book, so you kind of like, it needs to be somewhat readable to be able to go through it, and it is. Um, but it is an absolutely cracking book, and anybody who wants to know a little bit more about this world, other than the kind of total brass tacks and solid bits and pieces, could do an awful lot worse than checking that one out. So, brilliant books for this week. 27th of January 2022, The Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramhansa Yogananda. And yeah, I actually remember that. I can't remember the name of the place just over the way that's got the place called Little Mistletoe, but I can tell you the name of a Hindu spiritual leader who died 70 years ago. Take that one for what it is. So, talking of spirituality, this weekend... This weekend being the 29th and 30th of January is the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch. The most important piece of unscientific science that this world has probably ever seen. Certainly the most popular. People all over the UK, if nowhere else, get involved. And it's one of those where you can justify sitting in front of a window for an hour and just watching the birds. It's brilliant. Go on to the RSPB website, you can download the form, and they'll even give you a little kind of A3 spreadsheet of the birds you like to see, and just count the birds. There are one or two caveats you need to be careful of. You only ever count the number of birds you can actually see at one time. Because if you think about it, you see a robin come out of a bush and go to the bird table, and have a peck, and go back in the bush and then come out the bush and get the bird table and have a munch and go back it's probably the same robin you're seeing all the time so you can only actually count the birds you can see of a number at one time which is extremely difficult with our sparrows because there's something like 30 of them and they are seriously on the go the whole time basically you count them for an hour this week and then you go back put them on the rspb website send them off and They'll certainly get a nice thank you email. But as I said, it's kind of the most amazingly huge unscientific bit of science because obviously it's all performed by amateurs. It's not 100% reliable or 100% accurate, but it really does give the RSPB the trends of which birds are doing really, really well and which birds are not doing so well. And then they can compare that data to last year and the year before and the last decade and that gives them a really good idea of yeah, how bird numbers are changing, how they're adjusting, whether or not some species that were using our gardens all the time have now stopped, or whether they're being outcompeted, or birds that have started using gardens that never did before. So it's a, it's a really good time to relax with a cup of tea or a glass of wine or whatever you happen to fa fla flavor, flavor, flavor and get involved, but it's rspb.org.uk is the website. Everything you will need from there is completely free to sign up and uh, yeah, get involved. I'm not in an RM whether I should try and get some of the uh, children I help at the home I help out at involved. I've got a feeling that none of them could even probably sit for 20 minutes, let alone an hour. There are three of them by the way, so we'll have to see. Been thinking about it, but uh, who knows ultimately. Anyway, Talking of birds, we've got the little egret video. The one that I shot last year, and uh, if nothing else, it's interesting because hopefully you'll think, ah, oh, in the year or so since I shot this one, and originally it is it, you might think we've kind of come on a little bit, the quality of camera work is a little better, and if I finally get the gimbal that I've been threatening, then it will get even better still. Um, me as a narrator, quite possibly I have improved. So all I've actually done to the video, I've had a little bit of music underneath it and top and tailed it with my intro and outro clips. 
And I'm not going to say a great deal more right now, because if I do, I'll probably end up just talking over the, the video and telling you the same stuff twice. But I may well tell you to cut the bits and pieces at the end. So sharing the screen, share sound, optimizing video is there, little egrets. Here we go. You can see this small, very white bird in the distance. It's actually not that small. Its legs are about one and a half feet long. The body is probably about the same from head to tail. They're a bit like a small heron. As you can see, they're completely white, a little egret. And we get them down here at the brooks quite often through autumn. But they, they make their living wading around in the edge of water and they spear the fish with their long beak, similarly to herons do. But one of the reasons we're getting more of them is because, if you like, our climate's getting warmer. If you go down into France, you'll hear loads of them, see, see more of them. But in this country, they're just becoming more common, shall we say. So that's Little Egret. Lovely. Yeah, egret. We spooked it and it's taken off. What they quite often do Herons do too, we circle around behind you and then land again. Oh, it's two, got a mate. Wow, little egrets and a bonus. Wow. Pretty cool little video, I like that one. But uh, did you get that bit at the beginning? Yeah, the legs are about a foot and a half long. That's a helpful measurement, isn't it? But they're, they're, kind of, they're a small heron, effectively. They live very, very similarly. You get that beautiful white on white of the body, and black legs, which are a complete and utter contrast. They feed on fish. But again, same, same principle as the heron. They stand there really still in the water. Sometimes they'll mantle their wings so that they look, they kind of like pretending to be lily pads and things. So the fish will come thinking that they're in safety. And then of course they get pierced by that long spear of a beak. But they, I mean, I don't know if you've ever kind of seen them, but they're becoming more popular. 40, 50 years ago, they were a very, very rare visitor to this country. I remember when Ross was like nine or 10, something like that. We actually went on a holiday. We stayed in a caravan in Brittany and they were everywhere. I mean, I probably saw more little egrets on that week, probably on a couple of days when we went out for a wander than I'd ever, ever, ever seen before. But quite often in the brooks where that was actually filmed, um, we see them quite a lot. So, uh, it's pretty cool. Oh, one interesting piece of note. They actually have some kind of special long plumes on the neck. And there was a time in our distant past where those plumes were actually more valuable than gold. But imagine it, feathers. I guess it's the length and the colour. And maybe it's ladies' hats. That didn't help increase their numbers either. So... Interesting little fact, but obviously they've stopped doing that. Now the birds are protected and the numbers are increasing. But also, as I said, temperatures are rising as we go further north. And that means that they've expanded their range, which is dead cool. So I think that just about brings us to an end for this week. So I would say once again, thank you so much for coming. I hope you had an enjoyable time and found it interesting as Simon's waffled away. 
Uh, not been that much in the chat, so I've kind of like kept moving. And uh, next week we're going to have Vanishdale Falls Part Three. We're actually going to have the falls. It's technically going to be the first shared broadcast with John Turner of Educational Life. I believe he's going to have a PowerPoint of some seriously good news. Ultimately, ultimately Educational Life is about good news. So it uh, should be a pretty cool show. And if there's two of us there batting it out, we might have a run a little bit. We'll see how it goes. But um, ultimately, thank you very, very much for joining. And uh, have a cracking rest of this evening and a cracking weekend when it comes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>